Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the Relationship with God series. The topic is Putting it all together. Presented by Jesus and Mary Magdalene on the 11th of August, 2013 in town of Mergen, Queensland, Australia. This is session two, part one. Thank you. Hello, how are you this morning? Good, yeah, that's good. Uh, I don't think we've got much to say. We can pretty much get stuck into doing some questions and answers on the topic that we were talking about yesterday, I think. Um, is there anything we need to t discuss first with anyone? I don't think so. I don't think so. It's lovely to see you guys. So Joy wants to ask a question, I gather. You want to get stuck into it? <laughs> That's great. So we're talking, so the, the subject is relationship with God, putting it all together. We're discussing, of course, the five primary ways, the five primary things that we need to do to put it all together. But what we'd like to do today is talk with you about personal questions or general questions that you have on that topic about, you know, your personal experience and what kind of assistance that you might need in order to put it all together, if that makes sense. So, so um, do we have microphone handlers who are, so Corny's on this side and Fab's on that side. Thanks, Fab. Um, I'm in that cage and it seems to be getting smaller and I'm rattling around just feeling a bit of this and a bit of that and not really getting a long way and I've recognised that... Um, and I think I'm willing to accept more truth about myself. Yep. And um, and to grow my humility. Yep. And I just want help, I guess, with because um, it's offering. <laughs> with what? What's the biggest thing I'm not seeing? What's the biggest thing that's going to help me break that, down that cage? Well, I feel for yourself, Joy. The first thing is you're not as willing to accept more truth as you believe. And I feel that that a fair majority of the audience is in the same boat, actually. We, we believe we want more truth, but the way God delivers truth is through the law of attraction, as you know. And the law of attraction is showing you things every single moment of every single day. And, and of course, when we're not at one with God, there's always lots of things that it's actually showing us. There's things that animals do in their reaction to ourselves, people do in their reaction to ourselves, accidents that we have, just physical small accidents, even like when you're cutting up the vegetables and you slip, slip and stab yourself with a knife or all those kind of accidents that you have. These are all law of attraction events telling you what's going on. The majority of us have no desire whatsoever to know what they're about. And so what we do is we skip over them. Now, every time we skip over a law of attraction event, it's because we don't want to know the truth. That's, that's the reason why we're doing it. So, so what we need to do first is focus on, okay, the truth is the thing that will set us free from the prison that we've created for ourselves. Only the truth, in fact. And if you think of the prison, the prison is the fear, and, the, and truth is the only thing that exposes fear and, re, and reduces fear, in fact. So, so we have to then assume that if that's not occurring, our fear is dictating to us the truth. What we believe the truth to be is actually determined by our fear, not by the actual truth from God's perspective. And what's actually happening is that we are very resistive to receiving truth. And that's what causes a restriction of our internal life and freedom. That's, that's the thing. So, so if we understand that, and, and all of us have the capacity to receive information from God without having to talk to another person. That's the, that's the fact. So you don't need to go to someone who knows more than you do and actually find out from them what your problems are. Although many times those people would be willing to tell you. And, and, off, and frankly, for many of you, many of you have come to us in the past and, and asked what your problems are. We tell you and all we feel from you is resistance. All we feel from you is resistance. Which means that you didn't really want the truth. in that. Re and, and in fact, a lot of times we feel a desire to argue constantly about what is being presented to you. And yet, many times myself and Mary are actually presenting you the very next thing you need to address if you're ever going to progress. And for some of you, we presented that to you five years ago. 
and you haven't progressed since then, actually, for some of you. Many of you, in fact, are like in that boat. Where, where five years ago you had a conversation with us thinking that you wanted to know some truth. We told you some truth, you didn't agree with it, and you've been stuck on that issue for five years. And that's often been the case for, for many of you. So, so what we've got to do is the only... Remember, the doorway to the truth is humility. In other words, we have to want to know the truth before the truth will be exposed to us. The, the truth is always being presented to us, but it's whether we want to know it or not in the moment as that will determine whether we receive it. For the majority of us, we don't want to know it in the moment. right? And so we wait for person that we respect to tell us the truth. When God's trying to tell you, like God's the person you should respect the most, and God's laws are the, uh, are the, are the means by which we get told the truth constantly, and if we truly respected God, we would be watching every single thing that's happening in our day-to-day -day life brought to us through the law of attraction. And that would be constant, the constant message that's coming to us about what's really, really going on. But most of us ignore that. And then we think we still want the truth. So we go and ask people that we respect. You know, and, and they might be more clueless than we are, in fact. And, and in fact, many times I see many of you doing that with other people. Uh, um, going and asking a person who you respect but the reality is they have the same injury or a worse injury than you do so how are they ever going to help you grow if they have the same or a worse injury than you have yourself and you can't see it because you can't see your own injury so you can't see someone else's when you can't see your own so, uh, so there's this problem with truth constantly now the real question then becomes, well, how do I address all that problem, those all, pro all those problems? Well, the first thing, of course, as we've pointed out, so, is the law of attraction. That's God's messenger of truth when all other messengers of truth fail. I, I think I need a few extra things in there. <laughs> all right, so that's... God's messenger of truth to you when all other messages to you fail. Right? In other words, that is the constant message of truth coming to you constantly, every single moment. Right? And the majority of us ignore it or completely dismiss it or we try to get away from it or we're constantly trying to manipulate it. And the way we do that is we arrange our life so that we don't have to cope with our own attractions. So, so, for example, you get an email from a nasty person. The majority of us would then just go block, dunk, dump, dump, that's done. I'm never going to get an email from that person again. However, you're not considering that you attracted it. There's something going on in the attraction. Right? You think that by blocking it and just shutting it away and turning it off, that you're going to change anything? Definitely not. Definitely not. You're going to continue attracting it. And because you've blocked that very, very minor way of someone attacking you what happens law of attraction ramps up and now you get it in face to face instead of just by an email right and then because you block that and say I'm never going to see that person again what happens is someone gets in your face in a forced situation and actually attacks you and you can't get out of it anymore like this is what you're going to attract because it ramps up every single time and what we finish up doing is we ignore the law of attraction with all the little things and because we ignore it with the little things, the bigger things have to happen. So for many of you, this is what's going on in your life now. The bigger things are happening because you've ignored all the little things that, sh that were happening up until now that, uh, that were showing you a certain thing but you've ignored all of those and so now bigger things are happening and you go, man, I thought I was progressing but I'm attracting worse things. Well, of course you're attracting worse things if you've ignored the previous things. This is the law. The law is going to do its work. And God's going, the reason why God created the law like this is God wants to lead you to love. Every time you ignore the law of attraction, what you're doing is you're ignoring love, in fact. So you know how many of you hate the law of attraction? Because many of you feel that towards the law of attraction when something bad happens. You go, oh, this terrible thing happened to me. That, that person's a bastard and this person's this and that person's a bitch and she did this, that. And, that. And, and when you're raving on about all of those things, you're ignoring one factor and that is you are the common person in your life. You're, in your life, you're the person 
who is the person that's present all the time. So therefore, it's your attraction of what's going on right in that moment. You're ignoring that. And in that moment, what you're doing is you're basically trying to blame other people for what you are attracting into your personal life. All right? And, and that's the first problem we have with our humility. The first problem is the law of attraction showing us things, even tiny little things. And perhaps we can give some illustrations. Like, very little goes past myself and Mary's notice at home. All right? So we come away, we, just before I went away, I've got this lovely bush outside of the back of my tent. And, and before we went away, myself and Mary were still sleeping apart. So it was sort of, and we'd been sleeping apart for some time. So, and it was really lush. It was beautiful. Like, and, and it was a it was, um, passion fruit vine and lush and leaves like big as, bigger than my hand like this. And, you know, it was dark green and it was healthy and everything was beautiful about it. And I'm saying to Mary, oh, it's looking real good, that little passion fruit vine, you know, and give it some water or whatever. Anyway, um, we go away for two weeks. We come back home, and the entire vine has disappeared. And all that's left are these few straggly bits coming out. Possums and kangaroos ate the whole thing while we were away. The whole thing. Now, they didn't eat it while I was there, but they only ate it while I was away. And this is why we were away. I was, we were away in England. The very first thing I noticed, it's all eaten. And I know that it's my stuff. Right? Because while we were away, we were feeling quite attacked at different times while we were away. By spirits and by other people. And, I, and we could feel our own openness to the attack. And in that place, I knew that because I was open to the attack, there's the reason why those animals could now totally decimate what was very, very healthy before then. Now, while we were home, before we went away, that didn't happen. And the reason why is because I didn't feel that way. I felt like everything was pretty solid inside of myself, weren't, wasn't open to attack, and, and so everything was working fine. Does that make sense? Now, the average person would look at that thing and said, oh, I should have put a guard on it. Or, you know, being really upset about the possums and shoot a few possums and shoot a few roos. Uh, to get rid of the problem, right? That's what the average person would do. In other words, what we, we do is we externalize the problem. We, we actually blame the environment for the problem that our soul created. And I, we don't do that at home, right? We don't do that. We, we feel what's going on in ourselves. Do you want to bring up an example for yourself? Like, that was my example for me. That was your example. <laughs> I can't think of an example now. Okay. <laughs> I can think of... Um, I, just every interaction that I have in a day, I'm always looking at what in me is attracting it. Can I bring up an example that is a common one for you? Yes, please. When you're cooking, some, I very myself. frequently you yes. burn yourself or cut yourself. Always on my left side. Always on the left side. If I hurt my leg, it's my right one. Yeah, so, but that's just reflecting to me a lot of self-attacking emotions that I still am working through and a lot of feelings about um, being hard on myself. So, I, and I constantly... Yeah, I did it again this morning while I was making brekkie. <laughs> Cutting up fruit. <laughs> yeah, it was on the blender. So, yeah, that's something that very often happens yeah. for me. So yeah. just little events like that. If you notice the little events and feel about them, then the bigger events don't happen. All right? And so the bigger the events that are happening in your personal life, it means that you've ignored all the little ones. And, and I feel that God's always giving us opportunities to deal with the little <laughs> events. And very often we're used to controlling our environment or our life so we don't have to face what gets presented to us. It's, it's right there. Someone says, hey, I'd like to catch up with you. And you think, yeah, I don't really feel comfortable in that person's company. So I'm just going to make an excuse and say I've got something else on that day, which is telling a lie. And it's also avoiding what you've attracted. And because of that, then, as AJ is saying, you're going to have to attract something else that's going to confront that resistance within you. Yeah. So I have a, a, I've really had a change in my outlook in terms of what God is trying to show me and teach me. And if I, I'm noticing if I take up those things, growth happens, you know. And even if you don't deal with everything within you that created the attraction, you've at least started to grow some awareness about it or you've at least started to see some truth about yourself if you go into it 
with the desire to do that mm. rather than the desire to control or manipulate what's happening around you. So if we uh, look at these five primary things and then look at just the law of attraction in terms of our attitude towards the law of attraction. For the majority of us, our attitude towards the law of attraction is that we're using our will to try to avoid it most of the time. Does that make sense? Now, if you really honoured the law of attraction from, from God's perspective, you would never use your will to avoid your law of attraction. You would only take actions based on desire, and whenever anything that you did desire didn't happen, you'd see it as a law of attraction event. And you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be trying to avoid your fear by manipulating this law, or attempting to, because you can't be manipulated. All of God's laws can't be manipulated. But what we attempt to do is we go, okay, I'm not going to go out. Imagine, I'm not going to go out because every time I go out, somebody you know, treats me badly, so I'm going to stay home. Well, somebody will treat you badly at home then, right? And then you decide, well, I want no one else in my life, so I'm going to just be a hermit. And then you have animals treating you badly, right? Right, so, so the law of attraction is going to work every single time. Like, and, and if you're using your will to manipulate it or try to avoid it, then you're not honouring this beautiful, loving law. Does that make sense? You're not honouring the truth of God's laws. Let me finish the other relationships with this law. So you're not honouring it from the use of your will. With regard to faith, you don't have any faith in it. In other words, you don't have faith that if you address the soul-based emotional injury that creates the attraction, that everything will change. Now, many of you have gained some faith through past experience that that happens. You know, because you've had some events where you've faced up to them and then all of a sudden something changed. There's a few people came up to us yesterday and said, you know, one lady, um, I won't say names or anything, and uh, said to us, uh, she, had, she had falsely declared an insurance claim 20 years ago. And then she realised that that was wrong. And so what she did was she wrote to the insurance company about her false claim, realising that she might even potentially get put in jail for, for the claim, according to the policies, that's what can happen. And she wrote to them, she, she gave them back the money she claimed, plus interest for 20 years. Huh? Now, they, of course, had never received a letter like that. She explained a, a letter of all of that, and they, of course, had never received a letter like that. So you know what they did with that? They rang her up and said, we have never received a letter like that, ever. And it's amazing. So we're going to give you all the money back. <laughs> so they gave her all the money back. Right? Now, that's an example of how things can change when you deal with some things. Now, there was a lot of fear that had to come up in that process, a lot of desire to live in harmony with truth that had to come up in that process and act upon what she knew was truthful inside of herself, right? And, and when that happened, then this beautiful law attracts some positive events, right? This is the beauty of this law. You, you have the negative events attracted, but if you act in harmony with the laws... Now, through that, now there's some faith built in the law of attraction, that it's, that it's not just all bad, that there's these beautiful things can happen if you act in harmony with the law, right? If I can add to that on the subject of faith... Um, also, when we, when we start to receive the smaller laws of attraction and work with God with them and say, okay, God's a loving God who's actually trying to show me an error within me and I'll embrace this opportunity even though it might feel a bit scary or a bit painful, we begin to see that God doesn't have this hideous law that's there to traumatise us with terrible events. Because... Which is the way most of us <laughs> do believe the law is set up, right? It's actually, wow, when I really desire to participate in my growth, God brings me very gentle events that I can actually begin to grow and change with, and I don't end up ever attracting these really what are seemingly harsh events because I'm already an active participant. And so we begin to have more faith that God's actually a loving God as well and yeah. that God's laws are loving. So can you see, just by engaging this law in a different way, you then build faith in a number of things. Firstly, faith in the law itself, faith that God has actually got a loving motive for actually creating this law and so forth. This is stuff that builds in you when you engage it. Every time you avoid the law or manipulate, try to manipulate it in order to avoid something, you are not honouring those things. 
you're not honoring your will or your faith you also are not demonstrating any humility because it's your soul that attracted the event your soul nobody else's your soul attracted the event and yet most of the time we say oh that person did this and this person did that and that animal did this and we should have done that and we, we come up with all these external reasons why we should have or stop the results of the law and that is the, our lack of humility in play that's telling us how little humility we have in that moment right or or yeah. or we self-punish we go oh, i keep attracting these terrible things oh that's terrible that's my condition it's all horrible and god's trying to tell me that actually i'm full of error and sometimes that's not actually what god's trying to show you no. sometimes there's really positive things yep. what i've found is that engaging my um attractions with the media that i talked to you guys about last time i found actually yep god's helping me with my fear but also with my passion I love divine truth. <laughs> I want to talk to other people about it. And all this fear has been stopping me for years. And actually, I'm embracing what's coming towards me and I'm getting more passionate and more joy in my life. So often we have to be humble. Even in events where before you were completely afraid of. Yeah, and thought that they were traumatic and horrible. Exactly the same event. And now I feel like, oh, that was quite enjoyable. And I learned something about myself. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So there's humility, sorry. So there's humility to the, um, the error in love, but also the willingness to just feel through the stuff that, that comes up without analysing it too much, without going, what is God trying to teach me? Just to feel the feeling that's there feel right there. Feel what you feel in that moment. What the law of attraction is bringing you in that moment probably is related to the feeling you're feeling right at that moment, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course, that makes sense. But for most of us, what we go is, we're, Maybe, what's that about? What's that about? I don't know what that's about. What are you feeling at the moment? That's the fastest way to find out what it's about. Yep. Right. The other thing that we're not doing with the law itself is honouring the truth about it. The truth is, God's truth is, that this law is a perfect, loving law created to help you grow towards love and truth and towards God. And even if you're not growing towards God, it helps you grow towards love and truth. And when you engage this law you're going to have the most possible benefits that you could possibly have it's going it's the messenger of truth in fact so so we're not honoring the truth at all when we try to avoid the law when we try to manipulate it when we try to get away from things when we don't do things because we're afraid when we manage our life when we arrange our life to avoid discomfort all these things that we do every single day the majority of us and in the western world we do it more than anywhere else Right? If, if you're in the middle of Africa and you're living in a, in a hut that's made out of sticks and the rain comes and it's dripping everywhere, you can't avoid certain things about the law. Right? But here we can build a roof over the top that's made of tin and avoid all the drips. And, and, and yet our soul may still have the same attraction, but we've just created a comfort to avoid the law. That's all we do. And this is what we do most of the time. And in the Western world we do it more than anyone else. Right? So we, in this regard, have less res respect for the law than most other people in other countries who don't have those means to avoid the law. And then if we look at love with the law of attraction, as we've pointed out, it's a loving law. Like most of the time with the law of attraction, we forget that God loves us. We think the law, of, the law is really hard and harsh and terrible. And, and we actually imply to God that you're hard and harsh and terrible because I'm getting this hard and harsh you know, law tell, you know, doing certain things to me. And also, we don't have any love of ourselves honouring that we created the events. Whether they're positive or negative, we, we can at least honour that we are a very powerful creator. Right? Like when you think about it, if you create total devastation financially and you're like and you're destitute completely, you're a powerful creator. That's pretty hard in the Western world to create that. Right? So you're a very powerful creator and your soul is and, and sure your soul is creating powerfully in a maybe what you view as a negative direction, but but at least you can honor the fact that these are your creations, these are your emotions that are creating these things. Right? Now, for someone in the, in the third world, they're going to struggle to honour that because, because, of course, they are, have oppression and all of these other things that, that are pri often the cause of their lack of financial um, stability. But here, we don't have these things. 
right? So, so here we can say pretty much primarily we are the personal creator of our own lack of financial you know, welfare, really. That's, what, that's the truth. And yet we go, oh, this happened and that happened and the government wanted this from me and the people wanted that from me, so I had to declare bankruptcy and, and, you know, and I had to go through all that process. And all of it is avoidance of what the law is bringing you and also a lack of love for yourself. Because if you truly loved yourself, you go, I honour the fact that I've created all of these things. It must be something pretty powerful in my soul to create that. Because the average person doesn't create that. So it must be something pretty powerful in my soul. If I get to that and release that from my soul, I won't create it anymore. Now that's a, that's a pretty, like, that's pretty good knowledge, isn't it? That you, you know that your life can change if you change something. And all you need to do is feel the feelings that you go through while you're feeling destitute. That will help you work through what's going on, what's happening. So, so can you see even with the law of attraction, so, uh, and I'm only answering a part of your question so far, Joy. Just the one law, the law that brings you the truth. The majority of us have no, we're exercising our will in the opposite direction. We have no faith in it. We don't have any humility with what it brings to us. We don't want to know the truth of what it's telling us. And most importantly, we have no love of self or love of anyone else when we look at the law. And we constantly project outward saying, you did the problem to me. And we constantly project into God saying, why did you make this crummy law? Right? Um, I've just realised that I've been using my will in a very self-reliant way, thinking that I'm seeking more truth and humility, yep. and totally ignoring God's way, which is the law of attraction. Exactly. Exactly. This law is beautiful law, designed primarily to help you when no one else can help you, this law is always helping you. That's the beauty. So even when God cannot ask a spirit guide of yours to communicate to you what the problem is, what's going on, when, when you can't communicate with your guide, when you don't have a friend who's in a better condition than you can tell you what's happening, you don't have somebody who notices it. Or let's say most of our friends do know what's going on for us, but most of them are not good enough friends to tell us the truth. Right? Because I was so afraid of losing our friendship or you know, what we might do in reaction to the friendship. And so for the majority of the time, this is our friendliest <laughs> <laughs> way of finding out the truth. Right? And it's God's way of finding out the truth. And we all can engage it. We all have the same attractions. We, we all have a soul that engages this law. And yet the majority of us ignore it completely. Right? So there's our first problem. Our first problem is when we look at that law, we have no will, no faith, no humility, no truth, no love. <laughs> right? Can you see if we, if we focus on the development of these things in everything that we are linked to, then automatically our, our outlook on it all changes. Right? So now, what are, what's another law that helps you, and this is a part of the law of attraction, What's another law that will help you find out the truth about your life? Right? If we, if just wait for Corny to come down. Cause and effect. Cause and effect. So there's another law called the law of cause and effect. What is that law basically saying? Everything that's happened in my life today has got a cause that happened sometime prior to today or sometime prior to this very I mean, moment. Yeah. <laughs> because there, there had to be something that caused this effect. Right? That's what it's saying. And, and if I can find out the cause and get rid of it, then the effect will also disappear. Isn't that powerful to know that? It's a powerful thing to know. So what are the most majority of us to do with that? We say that's a heap of rubbish. Right? What we say is, and we use our will to change the effect. Many of you are doing this moment by moment during your day. You're using your will to change the effect of something that caused that effect. Now, of course, when you do that, you're going to have to do the same thing tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day. And after a while, it becomes such, so habitual that you think it's normal. You, you, you think a person that's in the celestial spheres would do the same thing. 
So do you think a person in the celestial spheres would go and put a whole heap of tree guards around all the trees? Do you think he would do that? No? Yep. But we're still constantly doing it, right? Oh, I, do. I have a good one that I do all the time. When we go anywhere and eat out, so we order food, uh, which has been happening quite a lot because we've been travelling quite a lot, um, whatever AJ orders, it's, it comes in a timely manner, it's delicious, it's wonderful. Whatever I order, um, usually sometimes there's an issue with it, often it, it comes like late. late or they get it wrong because I don't want dairy and I don't want all these things in it. And, and so my way of trying to get over that effect, which is an eff the cause within me is about me feeling like I'm allowed to have my desires without shame or feeling, you know, that, that I'm not being greedy by just having what I want. And also my fears of people not hearing me and I feel like people aren't really interested in what I say. So when I say things, people aren't really interested in what I say. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, and so my way to get over this effect is to then say, excuse me, uh, I just ordered this and it, didn't, it hasn't come or this is wrong or instead of just sitting with the fact that there's my soul again, I just attracted the wrong order or a late order or someone completely ignoring my order. Uh, yeah. Mm. Whereas it's pretty rare. I have to have a really bad day for that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Generally now. And, but as you know, I have described to you prior that when that has happened in the past, I've, had, I've sometimes cried for a couple of hours and dealt with that emotionally. Right? I also have to resist the temptation to avoid the effect by just, I'll have what he's having. Because <laughs> it works. <laughs> <laughs> she does that quite frequently. <laughs> When she's particularly suspicious in yeah. particular. <laughs> <don't she>? yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, if we truly honoured the real cause, which of course is something going on in the soul, and if we really want to get rid of the real cause you know, of any negative event, then of course we need to focus on the cause, not the effect. But most of us are focusing on the effect and not the cause. So, so what do we do when we get sick? We focus on the effect, not the cause. What, what do we do when we get a disease? We focus on the effect and not the cause. What do we do when something happens around our house that we're not happy with? We focus on the effect and not the cause. And most of us are doing this moment by moment every single day. Focusing on the effect, not the cause. Effect, not the cause. Effect, not the cause. Now, when we do that, we're using our will out of harmony with one of God's laws of love. We have no faith in it. We have no faith. We're demonstrating to ourselves that we have no faith and if we change the cause, then the effect will disappear. De that's what we're demonstrating. We have no humility, to, and we're saying the effect wasn't caused by the thing God's saying to us that it was caused by. So we, we want it to be caused by something else. We're constantly saying to ourselves, it wasn't caused by me. It was caused by those dirty scoundrel possums that are there, you know, that ate all of my tree. You know, that's the cause. And, and, I, and, and now I'm going, well, you know, honestly... I need to remove every single, it sort of feels like to me sometimes, I need to remove every single thing and I plant one tree and if it gets eaten, deal with the cause and then plant the second tree. <laughs> That's what I need to do. Does that make sense? And then if that gets eaten, deal with the cause and then plant one more tree. And when I get to the point where I plant the tree and nothing happens, ah, now <laughs> I've released all the causes. All right? But most of us don't want to do that. You know what we do? We plant the whole orchard because we're impatient and we want a result and all these kind of things. We plant the whole orchard and the whole orchard gets eaten. And so we're worried about that happening. So what we do is we put all guards around everything in the orchard. And of course, they get all torn down and damaged. And, you know, and uh, as Peter knows down in his 15,000 acre, 15, acre property, Man, pigs can come along and just rip up every one of them. And, you know, in the end of the day, you're going to be able to do nothing unless you deal with the cause. That's the truth. Right? Ivana, you want to ask? <coughs> it's coming around. So, so can you see, for the majority of us, we're constantly focused on fixing the effect. So um, I was just thinking about 
frost mm -hmm. with trees? Yeah. So would you even not put like something no. around it? No, I, I don't have any. All of our mangoes survive frosts. And the reason why is because I have very little fear left. Cool. When you have fear, you get cold, right? Is that not true? Right? When, when, when ice gets cold and it freezes, when, it gets free, when water freezes into ice, obviously then it destroys the plant. But what we've found is that the more you deal with your fear, we have minus six, minus seven sometimes at home, all the mangoes survive. But they didn't survive the possums. Yep. <laughs> that makes sense. Like, so they survived the frost. Not a problem. They didn't survive the possum. They ring, the possums ring bark the bottom of every mango. And that means, of course, that the mango dies. The whole tree dies. Mm -hmm. So I'd be far better off saying, OK, stop this whole pointless exercise of planting fruit tree after fruit tree after fruit tree, hoping for the best. Plant one, see how it goes. And if it doesn't go well, deal with the emotion. Then plant, you know, plant another one once the emotion's dealt with or you think it's done. And then watch what happens to that one, and then and so forth and so forth until you can plant one that actually survives, yep. and then you know you'll have dealt with a lot of things. That's the reality. Yeah, I see a lot of people um, saying that they're dealing with their emotions and they're getting to causal issues, but their life around them isn't changing, mm. and that to me is indicating that you're not getting to the causes. No matter what you think you reached, if your life doesn't change, the effect will always change when you reach the cause. Yeah. And so that's another awesome feedback system, isn't it, that God's set up? That so, you... so if I can even go further than Mary with that, for many of you, the love that comes from you towards other people has not changed the entire time we've known you. So you've listened to Divine Truth, some of you, for four or five years, and yet over that period of time... The love that comes from within you to other people cannot be felt to be any different than it was five years ago. That tells you that on the essential issues in your life, you have not changed. Right? So, so we need to be honest about that. If there's no change occurring, it is because of our unwillingness to engage these five principles in our day-to-day -day life. Simple as that. Yeah? Okay, so, Karen, can I just uh, talk about the law of cause and effect? If we were humble to it, we would, of course, focus on the cause rather than the effect. So instead of going around fixing up the effect, we would focus on what is the reason why this particular thing happened, and we would try to fix that instead. That's what we would do if we were humble. If we're not humble, we try to fix the effect, because we don't believe the cause has anything to do with us. When we're not humble, we feel that the cause is always to do with something else. All right? When we're humble, we see the cause has to be doing something to do with us because it's happening in my life. Right? It's my life. I'm the center of my life. And so whatever is happening in my life has to be related to a cause that is inside of me, inside of my soul. I would understand that. But when I'm not humble, I don't understand that. What I do is I want it to be caused by something else. I want it to be, I want someone else to blame. I want somebody else to punish. I want somebody else to attack. I want somebody else to be hurt rather than me. Right? That's what we do when we don't understand that law. We also are not truthful about it all. Because, you know, the beautiful thing about the law of cause and effect is it's telling you the truth every moment. Similar to the law of attraction, telling you the truth every single moment. And yet, what do we do with that? We're focused on the effect rather than cause. So we're saying, I don't want to know the truth. I don't want to know why this happened to me. All I want to do is fix it. And God's saying to you, you cannot fix anything unless you know why it happened. <laughs> right? But the majority of us are going... I don't want to know why it happened. I just want to make it different. Right? Now, if we do that, we're never going to make it different. Because the only way to fix what happens is by finding out the reason why it happened and fixing the reason. That's the only way to do it. And then, of course, when it comes to love, we're not loving ourselves if we're going around fixing up effects. Are we? 
It's like me planting my orchard, having it all ripped apart and uh, destroyed and everything, and then I go and plant another orchard, and, and I spend ten, you know, thousands of dollars on plants and everything, and I'm not being loving to myself. It would be far better if I just dealt with the emotion, and then all of the plants are protected. And once all the plants, are, I can I can plant a plant. In fact, once all the plants are protected, highly likely that any seeds in the ground will automatically come up anyway. Highly likely, right? But me, instead of doing that, what do I do? Go around trying to fix up, fix up, fix up, and in the end, it's pointless. And so that's why, basically, I've told Brendan give up planting fruit trees. Um, I've got to fix something <laughs> um, because all of them are getting destroyed at some point. Now, most of the time now when we're home, they don't get destroyed. But as soon as we walk out the door and go on a trip, come back, you know, 10 days later, 15 days later, all destroyed. All right? So that's telling me that whatever I was feeling while I was away is very different to what I'm feeling when I'm home. All right? And that's telling me that while I'm away, I can't protect my property for some reason. My soul is not protecting my property for some reason while I'm away. When I'm home, my soul is protecting my property. All right? So there's obviously something going on there, right? So there's a lot of information it gives you if you're willing to have a look. But we don't. All we want to do is deal with the effect instead. So we go around putting our guards up and we decide that, well, how do we stop the possums in? Oh, I'll build a great big enclosure over the whole tree. Like... And you go out in the forest, there's no enclosure over a tree. You know, and it's all just sitting there, no worries, not a problem at all. No enclosures over the tree. No, there's nothing around it. It still grows. Even if it's a fruit tree, it still grows. So, you know, but you come over to my backyard and it's not the case. So there's obviously something wrong, right? And uh, we've had to work through a lot of uh, attack type, feeling attack type emotions that are all about these kind of things, feeling bullied, attacked, and all these kind of emotions that it brings up. And as we deal with more of those, then less things get attacked. Right? I have a very good example about that. I, I think you might have mentioned in a talk previously that we used to have a magpie. <laughs> oh, was it a magpie? A peewee? Something. A Murray magpie. Murray yeah. magpie yeah, that peewee. would attack the window of, windows of our house. It would just fly in loops around the house and banging into every window. Many of you have got that happening at home, yes? Yep. Banging into every window. Banging into every window. And it got so bad sometimes that it was just almost every, all of the daylight hours. I don't know it how just... it ate. Because it no, never it didn't We were worried it was going to fall out like... of the sky of starvation <laughs> because it was it was so horrendous. And our windows would be plastered with, with bird poo all the way down the windows. <laughs> that it attacks all the way around. And every month or so, you know, AJ has to get out and deal with the effects of all this bird poo. So I get out the window cleaning gear, clean it all off, you know, wash all the windows. Within a day, half of it's back on there again <laughs> from this bird. Exactly. And... Um, of course, it's great to throw a rock at the bird or shoot at thing. <laughs> Would you... <laughs> That's what my father would do. <laughs> yep. Well, it's interesting because I was just talking to Lena about this before we started. They have a similar problem at their house sometimes. And she was saying, and I had to agree, <laughs> that we both started out going, we love nature. We love birds. We, love, we just want to live in nature. And then after this happens consecutively for a couple of weeks, you're like, I don't like nature. <laughs> I'm very angry. <laughs> so God's showing me something here, my resistance to this issue. I don't want to face I haven't had a day where I, let, I really let myself feel my anger. And like I love birds, as many of you know. But I, this day, I got a heap of rocks and I started throwing rocks at the bird. <laughs> just to get, I, knew, I knew I'd miss the thing, but just, uh, just trying to... You didn't to, have your glasses on. No, it? no, <laughs> that's, that's, that's hopeless. But just to try and express my rage with the whole thing. Yeah, right? so we went to the dark side of like, ah. Um, and then eventually I worked through, I realised that God was trying to teach me something. And it was about the use of my will, actually. Mm. I was sitting in a lot of fear and allowing a lot of spirits to attack me and just feeling burr and horrible and not getting through it. And I, this one day I realized, hang on, God's trying to show me I have a will here and I'm allowed to say no, I'm not listening. I'm not, I'm not you know, kowtowing to whatever, you're, whatever the influence is. And the bird does not attack our windows anymore. I'm talking for five years that I've lived with AJ, it was a constant issue. 
every day. I work day. through that one emotion, um, and it doesn't attack the, the windows anymore. But I was just talking to Lena about an, uh, something that happened at their house last week. So... Um, <laughs> it moved over. Yeah, the same bird. The yeah. same bird. I don't think no, so. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> that territory, all right. <laughs> so, yeah. I don't think so. <laughs> no, ours is still around. Ours is still they around. They, they around actually the merrily going around. We, we watch him sometimes out the front now, and he's digging up uh, out the front and the bosia piles and whatever. He, and, and he flies towards the bird, towards the window, and then he stops. <laughs> and, and then sometimes he, he, he stops and then claws up the side of the window and picks off the bug that he wanted from the window, but he doesn't do any poo on the window <laughs> yeah. anymore. And then he flies off. Yeah. He's really a polite bird, actually, now. <laughs> it's like he was a Jekyll and I... It's like Jekyll yeah, and it Hyde, was almost like, like yeah. the bird took on, like, demonic properties. We were like, this bird is evil. <laughs> the poor thing. It was yeah. just very spirit influence. Um, <laughs> but uh, having worked through that... Last week at Lena and Eagle's house, and sometimes they have some similar emotions to me where they have some fear and it attracts attack. And also when we also do filming down there, of course. So that brings a lot of the spirits who are surrounding us at our home uh, down to Lena and Eagle's home. You know, so with us. Well, last week what happened was um, Cornelius decided that he wanted to do an interview about his life or about some part of his life. And Igor decided to be the interviewer. So for these guys... This is very important for both of them because Igor's never wanted to be an interviewer. He works behind the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and and Courtney's always wanted to avoid any camera uh, where possible. Yes, he's trying to avoid it now. So for the guys, it was quite like a fearful kind of, that's a fair assessment, isn't it? It's sort of like, it was a bit scary, yeah, to put it mildly, maybe. Mm. And so the guys were sitting there and there was no birds around, there hadn't been birds attacking the house, had there? And all of a sudden, birds started attacking the window. Lena, while they're filming. Yeah, while they're filming. Lena told me that on every window of the house, there came a bird that started attacking. Every window, so separate birds. And on the main window, opposite where the guys were sitting, there was three birds in cycles. <laughs> right. And then they would stop and go, OK, what is going on for us? They would feel it. Every bird would disappear. So if that's not a clear demonstration of the cause and effect, and of course all those birds are gone from your house now, aren't they? <laughs> Still come back. Depending on how much you're open to attack. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I thought that was a pretty incredible example of how suddenly it reminded me of that Hitchcock movie, you know, the birds, where there was just like <laughs> birds <laughs> attacking. <laughs> and then they'd own it and they'd all go away yeah. until they got afraid again. So, so what we're getting at is that both of these laws, they give you direct feedback, right? They always give you direct feedback, but for the majority of us, ignore it. And what we try to do is change the effect rather than the cause. So you know what they do now with the pigeons in, the, in a lot of countries around the world, in a lot of cities? They put up these metal spikes that are so sharp that the bird can't land on the spike without dying, like getting punctured by the spike. And so, of course, all the pigeons that are doing it, all the other birds that are doing it, all don't land there anymore. Well, that, that's an illustration of dealing with the effect. Right? And, and that is not a very loving thing to do, obviously. But we are constantly doing that in our day-to-day -day lives, if you analyse your day-to-day -day life. Now let's go to Karen, who's been waiting for um, some time. Um, there's questions about my using my will in the wrong direction. Yep. Um, there's two questions, actually. Uh, dementia and suicide is quite prominent in the females on my mother's side of the family. Sorry, just say that again. Dementia, Dementia and suicide. And suicide. Yep. Um, I personally have no, almost no painful childhood memories. When I allow myself to feel that something in my current life hurts, it pretty well never goes naturally to any childhood event that I can remember. Yep. So the first question is, is it enough to feel the hurt or is my unwillingness to see that people in my childhood have harmed me affecting my progress? Well, for yourself, the problem is very different to what you think it is. Uh, um, your, your family is very open to spirit influence. And, and the main reason why is you have a multi-generational problem with fear. 
fear has been passed down from generation to generation and each sub subsequent generation has have a bit has have a, a stronger build up of fear which once the previous generations pass in the spirit world they then influence and so you have a very large amount of fear that gets passed down through these generations of your family coming from a European background to two wars uh, having experienced two wars and so forth and as a, as a result of these of these constant um, this fear you attract a large number of spirits who influ who influence you on a moment by moment basis and you're completely unaware of it as are the majority of your family in fact so all of your children are affected in the same manner you're affected in the same manner from groups of spirits using your fear against you basically but you don't see it as that so what happens is that you've got basically you've got yourself you've got spirits that surround you who either wish to use your fear against you or who and there's another group of spirits around you who wish to have you not have to experience any fear at all so there's one group is basically saying to you don't experience any fear at all ironically by not experiencing any fear you're attracting also this other group which are utilizing your fear and manipulating you and many of the actions you take as a result uh, through through the, your fear of them actually through your fear of spirits and so now you've got two groups of spirits who are influencing you greatly now when you feel some of your grief the reason why it's not taking you back to your childhood is because it's not your grief it's it's their grief the, the group of spirits who are afraid have a lot of grief and you're often experiencing their grief because you are un unwilling to experience your own right and and you are also terrified of this group of spirits because when when you choose to feel your own this group of spirits will up the ante they will up their attack of you right because they want you to be suppressed they want you in your current mode that's all they want they don't want anything else they don't care about you they just want this and so so you're terrified of these spirits and you agree with these spirits <coughs> internally you're terrified of these and agree with these and so what and by the way um, there's probably yep you're, Nina you are definitely in the same category in terms of the amount of fear That's your family it. has the same amount of yeah same amount of uh, uh, multi-generational fear and you're full of it and for both of you you don't realize it but majority of time you are trying to get away from your fear in almost everything that you do and anger or the projection of anger is very simple through you so what a lot of people feel from you is anger and the reason why they feel anger from you most of the time is because you're terrified of the people who are projecting the anger and using you you using your body using your ectoplasm to project anger to other people and this is why many people are afraid of you as well does that make sense because because they they're not they're not necessarily feeling you they're feeling a mixture of you and the spirits with you and the spirits with you are enraged and uh, enraged with a lot of things enraged with God enraged with having to feel enraged with quite a number of different things and those spirits are totally willing to project anything through you and you're just letting it happen right because you're terrified of them and that's why you're doing it now this is your primary problem and if you think about it I've said this to you I can remember saying this to Nina nearly three years ago in a talk uh, that she completely ignored at the time and I've actually had a personal conversation with you about this particular problem I've also had a personal conversations with Anna your daughter about this particular problem all of which she doesn't necessarily believe and and I've also had personal conversations with your daughter Nina about this particular multi-generational problem most of which she has completely ignored to her own detriment even that's caused her to have some psychotic episodes as a result and so forth these are all the results of this problem this problem of the spirit influence that's going on and the amount of fear that you have to even acknowledge it and in particular the amount of fear of the potential violence of these spirits that surround you right? uh, so um, if I'm terrified of them how can I tell if a lot of the emotions that I'm feeling are not my own emotions um, 
what do I do to prevent that happening? Well, you need to, to understand firstly that you're making a choice to not feel your own emotions because you want to feel the emotions of spirits around you because you know that if you feel your own emotions, these spirits will attack you and you'll feel worse. And the reality is, is you feel worse when you try to attempt to feel your own emotions. And you don't want to feel that feeling. So, so you give up the process. Does that make sense? Except, well, I, this wasn't one of the other questions I had, but when I do feel my emotions, I feel that God is with me. And is that really God then? No, a lot of it is these spirits trying to falsify to you what's going on. If, like, the only way... God is always with you. But I can but, feel it more when I'm... Yeah, well, it. that's not who I feel you're feeling. Right. No, no. Because quite often when you say that, like, well, I've spent a little bit of time in your company, and, and uh, quite often when you say that God is with you, in the, the, oh, I don't feel God with you at that time, I feel some spirits with you, telling you that, you know, if you go down this track, that's the way they want okay. you to go. And there's a deep, there is a deep feeling inside of your families and therefore, all of your children, uh, your parents as well, the parents that have passed, the same feeling exists uh, all in them. The same feeling is avoid, avoid, avoid fear, avoid fear, avoid fear at all costs. Do whatever you can. Even if it's self-punish, self-punish, right? Which is something that you're given to doing at times, Karen. Self-punish rather than feel fear, right? This is, this is what these spirits want you to do, right? And you're willing to engage it because you're unwilling to feel the terror of being attacked, which is a multi-generational problem in your families, this terror that exists. So the problem with the emotion is that it may not take you back to an actual childhood event because it's a multi-generational problem that's been passed down over generations through different wars and so forth that all of the generations prior have experienced. Right? And so since it's that, there is this feeling in you, and you're a very logical person in particular, and you're, many in your family are very logical, and you go like this, you go, because I don't know what the emotion's about, I can't feel it. And so you have a complete closeness almost to feeling emotions you do not understand. Now, you've attempted to try to get to some of them, but the problem is you're so open to these spirits, these ones who are violent with you, that whenever you try to get to them, they try to shut you down. And you're so willing to be shut down because of how much fear you have. So what I would do if I was you is focus totally on attempting, praying to God, having trust in God, having some faith that you want to get to see and feel this fear that's inside of you. So all the trees that are being eaten in my garden would be a starting point too, maybe. Yes, yeah, no, that will all be fear of attack. Right. Can I just add something on, related to what you're talking about? As someone who has a lot of fear also, as I've um, progressed, I've found that what I used to think was a good feeling or a sense of well-being, I'm just thinking about you feeling God with you, mm. was actually just me getting away from fear for a little while. So when you're pleasing these spirits, there's not as much threat coming towards you, so you feel better. Uh, it's not a real better. And what I've found is that it wasn't real happiness, it wasn't real joy, it wasn't even love. You know, I used to think happiness, joy and love was just the absence of me feeling absence terrified. Of fear, fear, absence yeah. of fear. When actually those feelings and God, it's a, a much lovelier feeling, um, but it, we can only really experience them more fully when we're willing to confront fear. Just lately, I've picked up on a desire that I wasn't fully aware of, and I'm absorbed in that all day. Yep. Is that, that's avoiding all of that too, isn't it? Yes, very frequently it is. It's great if it's a real desire, so go along with it, but if you find you're not feeling emotional, you're not emotionally connected to what you're doing, then it's a great indication that actually there is a deep avoidance going. And in fact, these spirits here, um, these spirits here, the ones who are afraid, they desperately want you to find something that you, you're not afraid of yep. and just do it with a passion and that way avoid the rest of your life. That's yep. what they're attempting to achieve. And both you and Nina have had lives like that where you just get very busy doing things, don't you? Yeah. And avoid And things. you're both very harsh on yourself, body-wise. Very hard on yourself. Your fear is racking your body. It's affecting how you look, 
the lines that you have on your face, all these different things that are happening are all the effect of the fear. Once you release the fear, a lot of these things will disappear naturally. But the fear is going to make it worse and worse and worse while it's within you. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And this is why some people... Were, some. Uh, uh, so how, how old are yourself at the moment? Just turned 57. 57. So you're seven years older than myself. Right? So in terms of um, how you know the lines on your face and how your body feels, I know you're very, very fit. But I also know that you're very hard on yourself. And you force your body into lots of things that... that you're actually, when you start feeling, you'll feel quite tired doing, mm -hmm. actually. And, and your body is exhibiting in itself the fear that's governing your life. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. and, and the same applies for yourself, Nina. The fear is governing, this fear is governing your life and affecting your body, affecting how, far more things than you're currently aware of. And so my suggestion is to pray, have some faith, firstly, that when this fear is felt and released, that you will feel a lot better than you currently do. Have some faith in God that God wants you to feel this fear and get past it. Have some faith that this, once you've released the fear, these spirits will have a little effect or no effect, in fact, on your life. And have some faith that uh, if you love yourself, that these things can occur. But at the moment, that's not what you have. You would rather find any other emotion than fear. And you spend a lot of your life doing exactly that, trying to have some kind of emotional experience other than fear. Yeah. Yeah. The, the other question, which I don't know is relevant now, is, was, is seeing how I have hurt others in the same way that I'm feeling hurt a useful alternative? Well, yes, you have hurt others, obviously. But one of the things that you need to understand is that the main reason why we enter into you know, anger-based or hurtful-based situations with other people, where we blame other people for things that you know, they either might have done or may not have done, but we just have a certain feeling that we should blame them, or we try or attempt to hurt them, a, lo a lot of this comes from fear. Right? And this is something that almost everyone who is afraid does, every single moment. Does that make sense? And, and when you honour fear first, you don't care what love is. That's the reality. Now, you have a very, you Karen, have, have a very strong conscience, right? So when you notice yourself being overtly with something that you notice yourself being in a rage, you, you get, you, you stop yourself, right? You, you control yourself. But there are many times when you're actually in a rage, both with your children and with other people, that you have, and a lot of it's very passive aggressive. And, and because it's passive aggressive, you let yourself get away with the fact that you actually feel rage. And, and the rage is covering over the fear. So whenever you feel this rage rise within you, the key thing is to go, okay, this is not really about rage, it's about fear. And all I'm doing when I revert to rage is I want to feel powerful. I want to feel more powerful than my own fear. And so in those moments when you feel angry, the best solution is to go, okay, Let's go back to the fear and see what this fear is all about. In fact, you prefer rage, shame, self-attack, attack of others, anything, really, other than fear. And this is, uh, this is the problem with this multi-generational kind of fear, is that's what it makes you feel. It makes you feel like you'd prefer anything else other than fear. And yet it's the fear that you need to yeah. go to. I don't enjoy feeling angry. I make myself do it, but yeah. I have to say I'm really afraid of feeling. Well, I don't know how to feel fear, so I have exactly. to work on that. And Jesus. the reality is, you you are storing fear in your body, so it's wrecking your body, but you still don't believe you're able to feel it. But the reality is, once you allow yourself to become more truthful about that this is all about fear, and you allow yourself to be sensitive to that, and you allow yourself to be aware of what's really going on around you, you will easily feel your fear. Easily. Remember yesterday, AJ drew the picture of the, the truth is only exposing a certain amount of fear? If you just really allow yourself to see more truths, more fear will be exposed. Mm. And... And you won't have to try to feel fear. Yeah. Uh, it'll, it'll happen. And for both of you, just the thought of feeling fear is enough for you to have a cry. Can you, can you feel that? Just the thought of feeling it is enough for you to cry. So that tells you how strong 
the fear is actually within you. Just the thought of experiencing it makes you feel, you know, like crying. So it's very important to understand that. Yeah. If we could just go straight to Vivana, and there was Rachel was had her hand up behind, so we go. I was just going to ask: Do I have the same issue as um, Karen and Nina? Because I know I get into a rage quite easily, mm -hmm. and I have noticed that um, quite a few months ago, I decided that. Like, I, I was depressed all the time and just, you know, um, just constantly in this crappy space and addicted to the crap, yeah, yeah, <laughs> pretty yeah. much. But I decided that I was going to get out of that. So I started taking more actions, like, with things that I love doing. Yep. Um, so I stopped being angry for the... Because I was angry pretty much every day, just angry about everything, just hated the world, hated people. Yep. Hated myself, yeah. hated my family, yeah. hated Justin, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, uh, so then, so as every day went by, it's like I stopped being as angry, but then I realised that I'm just in this fear all day, like mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. Go outside, talk to anyone, go downtown, do my things that I need to do. Yeah. Fear, 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 fear. Just living in this fear all the time. Yep. And so... While it's nice to not be feeling angry every day, yes. <laughs> every moment of every day, I'm now feeling afraid every day, but living, living in it and like This is, Karen this is what I would call progression. Okay. Right. But, <laughs> Whereas, but you don't like, you well, don't like fear. Well, yeah. like you would prefer anger than fear, right? Well, yeah. So that's why it's obviously easy for but me. But even though you prefer like, it, you're still going with fear, which is good. Which hey? is great. Yeah. <laughs> Remember, remember, I've drawn this uh, frequently, where I've said, where we've said we have fear, right? And then we have our addictions, which cover over our fear. And when our addictions don't get met, we revert to anger, right? Yep. So when you stayed in anger, you were just stayed in this. Basically, when you stay in anger, what you're doing is you're staying in this tantrum. Give me what I want. 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 You're I'm not, not getting what, what I want. want. <laughs> you know, like, and. And, you know, everyone around you is not giving you what you want. But so, it's with everything, you know. Even the animals are not giving what you want. The birds are not giving you what you want. You know, the work, where your work's not giving you what you want, your partner's not giving you what you want. Your mother and dad are not giving you what you want. Nobody's giving me what I want. And, and so now you're angry with everything, right? Yeah. Now, now, that just covers over some addictions. When you're prepared, and your addictions are the things that are suppressing your fears. So when you're prepared to feel this fear, to actually feel it, feeling it is the only way it can be released. Mm. Right? So when you're prepared to feel the fear, the anger will easily disappear. Right? But now you'll feel terrified most of the time. Yeah, that, that's, that's what's happening. And it's horrible. And I'm getting to this yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, it's not a drawback. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying it's not. It's a, it's a good thing. Well, I guess I'm getting to this point now where it feels... It's just happened for so long. I think it's been... Well, I know I made the choice when I moved into this house that I'm living in now. So yep. it's been like four or five months or something. Yep. Uh, so I guess it's getting to the point now where it's becoming more and more painful because it, I'm just in it every day. So it's like, it's, it's like I'm just starting to go, all right, hang on, <laughs> I need to actually deal with this now. Exactly. So. Exactly. See, see uh, the, the beauty is you're no longer reverting to anger. Now, what happens with the majority well, of people? Well, I mean, uh, some time, yeah. Yeah, I all the still, time I'm talking well, about. Oh, yeah. Yep. yeah. So, so the, what happens with the majority of people is they stop the anger because they realise the anger is getting out of hand, right? And they start feeling the fear that's underneath the anger, so they start feeling the fear. But then the fear gets too intense. So what do they do? Go back to They anger. go back to feeding some addictions, and that, in fact, will produce more anger when those addictions don't get met. And they never get below this fear threshold. Mm. Now, the majority of women who are here present today and yesterday are in this boat. You are not getting beyond your fear threshold. So when you are crying, you are actually most of the time not crying about causal emotional events. You are crying in a tantrum. You are having a tantrum, <laughs> right? Just like a little child's having a tantrum, you're having one. You're more willing to cry than you are to feel fear. That's the reality. And remember, how many times have I said that to you as a group? 
for women. What have I said is the main problem? More willing to feel their sadness than they are willing to feel their fear. But their fear is what caps most of their sadness. So how are you ever going to get to the real sadness unless you're prepared to feel your fear first? That's what I've noticed with myself. I was saying to Mary yesterday, um, it's like I'll start crying about something, but I can actually feel <laughs> this fear there. And I'm like, oh, now I'm getting to the point where I'm like, hang on, if I'm crying right now, <laughs> but I'm feeling afraid, like it doesn't really, I don't know, it, it's like I'm starting to realise, hang on, all that crying that I have done hasn't Has, done anything. because No, not, because it's been a tantrum. Yeah, and, and crying like, in a tantrum never does anything because it's not the cause, yeah, it's an effect. And the fear <coughs> isn't feeling any less than what it did. Exactly. Because yeah, The because only way fear myself. can be released is by feeling it. Yeah. And the majority of you ladies do not want to feel it. If you feel, you can feel the stubbornness in you about this. Honestly, you can. You don't want to feel it. You don't want to feel your fears. And you want to revert to anger rather than feel your fear. Majority of you feel this way. The, you know, I asked you yesterday why the majority of you are single. This is one of the primary reasons why the majority of you are single. You don't want to feel your fear. All right? And that's a primary cause, in fact. Your fear of opening up your heart in a relationship and having a man abuse you or use you or, you know, your fear of all of that is so intense that you would prefer to be angry rather than open up your heart and be loving. That's what you prefer. Okay? So this is a big problem. Now, if we look again at these particular things in terms of how they, these things can cure that. You see, when we exercise our will to feed our addictions, our anger will build and no fear will ever be addressed. The majority of us exercise our will to feed our addictions. Physical, emotional and spiritual addictions each of us have. So some of you are addicted to the concept, for example, that, that Jesus should be a person that comes along and solves all your problems. That he does all the work for you. You're addicted to that concept. And of course when Jesus comes along and somebody comes along and says he's Jesus and he doesn't do that, you go, he's not Jesus. Because <laughs> Jesus would do that. Jesus would fix all my problems for me. You know, he, he's sacrificed, right? He's the one that has to do all the work and I should be able to just sit in my lounge chair waiting for him to do all the work and when he's done all the work, I'll feel better. It doesn't work like that, right? But that's the way we want it to work and that's at the use of our will. We don't want to use our will understanding, and this is an issue of love, we don't want to understand that this emotion is inside of myself. No one else can release it for me. No one else can do anything about it other than me. Right? If I loved myself, I would honour that. And can I add to that? I often see people saying, I've got to feel my fear, I've got to feel my fear. So they, they think I'm working on humility, but in fact, a lot of the decisions we're making in our life, our will-based, what we decide to do, is actually to avoid fear. So it, it's, it's never going to work. So you're when actually you... using your will daily to avoid your fear. And this is how will and humility can, they, they support each other. You know, when you really want to feel yourself, you'll use your will in order to make decisions to, that will help you feel, support you feeling, that will confront your fears, and you won't ever... And, and also, when you use your will in that way, it will help your humility develop because you're not avoiding things. Did I explain that? Yeah, clearly? no, yeah. I feel, I don't know if everyone understood, but I yeah. feel that I did. <laughs> One out of 150, <laughs> who probably already knew it already, but. <laughs> um, so, so whenever we are using our rage to mask our fear, we're not loving ourselves. We're not being honest with ourselves. We're not being humble. We don't have any faith in any of God's laws that once we get to the cause that everything will be cured. And we're using our will to feed our addictions. Like... All of those things are not happening in that, mo in that place. When we are feeding our addictions, we're not loving to ourselves. Most of you believe that you're loving to yourself when you feed your addictions, actually. Most of you still believe that. Most of you still think that, you know, when you get up in the morning and you desire that coffee, that giving yourself the coffee is love. That's what you believe. You know, or you go out to dinner and you're with some friends and they all have a drink and, and, and there's alcoholic drinks and you decide, oh, I'll just go along, it's okay, it's just one time, 
whatever, and you think that's love, feeding your addictions is love. It's not love. Some, in relationships you think feeding addictions is love. Right? Many of you feel that feeding your addictions in almost every case is love. It's not love at all. You are permanently harming yourself until such a point in time as you're willing to feel your fear. So, so, so while you're feeding your addictions, you are avoiding your fears. And while you're feeding your addictions, you're never going to get to your fears. And therefore, you're never going to get to the grief that's under it. You're never going to be at one with God feeding your addictions, ever. That's reality. And yet, the majority of you are not even aware that if you passed right today, the highest desire you would have when you enter the spirit world is to feed your addictions. And all of what you've heard about divine truth just get chucked out the window, to be honest. Because in the spirit world, it's much easier for you to feed your addictions than it is here on earth. It is also faster. It is also... Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the, 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 the passion and desire to do it is very strong. And there is no external resistance to doing it. In other words, there's no people on earth who might put you in jail if you do it. See, here on earth, some of you, if you fully acted upon some of your emotions right now, you'd be thrown in jail, right? Because it wouldn't be acceptable by society. So that's the only reason why you don't do it, right? When you get to the spirit world, you won't get thrown in jail if you do it. So it's highly likely you go ahead and do it. Can you see? Right? So these addictions are a primary uh, thing that we're still feeding and as a result and we don't understand it's not loving to, to to continually feed your addictions it's not honest it's also not humble it's also not d d developing any faith that in the end when you remove your addictions you'll be happier most of you don't believe that most of you believe it's only when the only time you're happy is when you get your addictions met <laughs> right and the reality is, from God's perspective, you're going to be much happier once you release the addictions from your life. But most don't believe that, see? Most, don't, most people on earth don't believe that. Let's face it, do they? You tell the average person on earth, the average guy on earth who gets drunk every weekend, that if he gave up the addiction to drinking every weekend, that he'd actually be happier? And he'd tell you, he's, you're an idiot. That's the only happiness that he has. He's working solid through the week so he can get enough money so he can drink most of the way on the weekend. And this is the way the world we live in thinks. And many of you still think that way with your addictions. You still think that feeding your addictions is going to bring you happiness. It's not. Feeding your addictions finishes up destroying your life, actually. And if it doesn't destroy it while it's here, it will certainly destroy it while you're in the spirit world. Because many of us, because when we don't deal with an addiction here on earth, you know what happens when we pass? We then try to feed the addiction in the spirit world and we just keep trying to feed it, keep trying to feed it. And many of you will keep trying to feed your addictions after you hit the spirit world for years. You'll never get out of the hells of the first fear doing that, but you will keep doing it, keep doing it, until you exhaust yourself with the pain of it. And then you'll stop. My suggestion is to stop earlier <laughs> than that. And, and Amanda, can I compliment you? Because I feel you've taken a step. You've taken some active steps to do that. That would... Mean but but I'm what's going to take the next step? Yep. No, but you are in a critical condition now. The critical condition is this: you don't want to feel all of this, yeah. and you need to acknowledge that you don't want to feel it all. And and this is a very very uh, what I would call um, you need to take care with your next steps. The reason why is there will be a tendency to want to avoid it and go back to this. Mm. Or addiction. Does yeah, that make well, I've sense? I've noticed that happened um, just with some stuff that was happening a few weeks ago. I um, uh, probably won't, yeah, won't go into the story. But um, so something was happening for a couple of weeks and I was really angry and just in a rage. Yeah. And I had, because just before that, I had just been starting to feel like, uh, you know, with I think it was the last seminar maybe, or one of the most recent seminars was saying that I had um, repented about, um, you know, having harmed people and was noticing more and more every day just yep. what my um, actions were doing towards yep. people. So I started to feel before this sort of two-week uh, thing that happened that I was making, like I, I had love 
in mind, like every day, like, you know. I would so you're feeling positive. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, I was consciously aware every time that I would interact with people, just um, my own stuff that was going on that might have harmed them, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, just the choices that I was making. And But then, yeah, this thing happened. And then I realised a short time after that, hang on, all that stuff just flew out the window and <laughs> I just went right back to square one and I'm like, this really sucks and I want to go back to how I felt just before that. Yeah. So, yeah. so what you're starting to feel is the difference when you're truly happy compared to when you're just happy in an addiction. Yeah. And, yeah. and what you will start to feel when you're in that place is you start realising that every time you revert back to the addictive processes, it actually hurts more now. Well, Before, yeah. you would have been normal with that. Yeah. Right? But now it hurts. Yeah. yeah. And, like, um, uh, it, more and more I feel with Justin, the more uh, that I keep engaging in the addiction, it just feels wrong. Yep. And it feels like it's not getting us anywhere. Yep. And we're just creating the same cycle like we have for the last three years. Yep. Like, same thing, we talk about the same problems. Yep. You know, I'm angry about the same stuff, he's angry about the same stuff. And yep. yeah, uh, so yeah. And but you, yeah, it's just that next step. Of that's right. And feeling. the pain of that starts going, okay, this is both of us wanting our addictions met, both of us not wanting to feel our fears. Once you get to this layer where you start feeling your fears, you don't want to desert it. <laughs> you know, you want, you want to let yourself go through it rather than getting out of it. And yeah. what we see a lot of people doing is they hit this place. And unfortunately, if you think of it like this, the fear is like that in our mind, right? And also often in our emotions. It's a big wall, right? So you think of this as a big brick wall, you know, like with all the bricks here. And, and here's little you coming along to this <laughs> wall, right? And so you go, you go up to it. That you looks sort of, pretty huge. You budge against it a bit, you know, and then you go, this is too big for me to handle. But what, what we don't realise is one truth in that place. All of that is actually inside of you. So therefore, you're already handling it. Mm. All right? And, we don't, and all you need to do is experience it to release it. You're actually already living in it. So therefore, you're already handling it. It's not going to be any worse than what you've already had to handle. And the thing is, like, the more I live in it anyway, the worse it feels every day because exactly. I am trying to avoid it. And exactly. yeah, It actually takes more energy to avoid it than to feel it. To feel it, yeah. yeah. And that's so. the beautiful thing that God's done too with our soul. It takes more energy to avoid an emotion than to feel the emotion. So mm. it makes sense to just feel it. <laughs> You something know. I was going to ask, because um, something I still don't understand um, properly is about like living in truth, mm -hmm. because what I have in the past... Um, can I, rather than you go through an explanation, okay, yep. can I just give okay, a few yep. things about that? Yep. It's impossible to live in truth while you have so much fear inside of you. Yep. Impossible. Okay. So give up the idea of living in truth. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right? Give up the idea of being present, because it's impossible to be present while you have so much fear inside of you. Give up the idea that you're connected to anything, because you're not connected to anything while you've got so much fear inside of you. Right? Just focus your attention on feeling the fear. Okay. Nothing else. But haven't you said in the past that, uh, like you've said in the past that um, you need truth, love and humility to be able to grow towards Yeah, God. but what you're yeah. doing now is being truthful. You, tr you truthfully have a whole heap of fear inside of your soul. Okay. You're now being truthful about it. Before, when you were angry, you weren't truthful about it. Okay. Now you're being truthful about it. Now you're actually starting to choose to feel it rather than blame other people, blame mm -hmm. your environment, blame the world. As blame much, I'll say. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> but you're starting to, like I said. Yeah, it's, yeah. Just, it's a process that you're going through. Yeah. And, and this is a more truthful place. You are living in more truth in that moment. Okay, so well, so forget about trying to live in more truth. Just okay. focus on one thing. This is what I have inside of me. And this is what I'm feeling right now. And I need to feel this until it's all gone. That's focus on that. See, the problem with fear is that it prevents the absorption by your soul of truth. So no matter what intellectual truth you believe you have right now, it cannot enter your soul unless you release your fear. Mm. It's impossible. And this applies to everyone, by the way. 
Truth cannot enter your soul unless you release your fear on the same subject. It can't enter your soul. So it's only entered your head. Right, right now, most of the things that I've given you about divine truth have only entered your head. Right? And it's only entered your head because you've been unwilling to feel your fear. When you feel your fear, now your soul will start absorbing the truth. And then it will be automatic to live in it because your soul has absorbed it. Well, I've found that a little bit because um, I remember at the last seminar I had a feeling like I wanted to come and talk to you guys but I felt really afraid and like just because of past experiences I've had and my fear then it's like... Oh. Past experiences of talking to oh. us have been terrible, haven't they? Well, I mean, <laughs> like Trauma. my own feelings that have <laughs> I come up. I understand. But how many of you feel that, that past experiences of talking to us have been terrible? Yeah. So this is a common feeling. It is a common feeling. Yeah. Yep. And, but I, I purposely uh, made the point of feeling through a bit of the fear before the seminar. And then I came and spoke to you guys afterwards. And I, it was really nice. <laughs> like, I'm so exactly. stupid. I make up this big, stupid idea of what I think is going to happen and how I think you guys are going to be angry at me. And, yeah, you know, we're angry stuff. at everyone all the time. Yeah, but it's yeah. like I blow up this big, stupid picture in my head. And then normally I'd go, oh, no, I don't want to go and talk to them because that's just too scary and they're going to be like this and that and da-da-da-da-da. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's been good to yeah. just sort of feel through some of it. So. Yeah. Now, yeah. the next person was Rachel, just yeah. to be Thank you, guys. Me, so. Pleasure. Can I, before Rachel begins, sorry, Rachel, do you understand this principle that if fear is inside of your soul, truth on the same subject will not be able to enter your soul. So any truth that you think you've heard has only gone into your mind. It hasn't gone into your soul on any particular subject. So if there's one subject where there's no fear at all, then that truth may have entered your soul. Right? But any subject that we, on, in which you have fear your, tr your soul cannot absorb the truth while that fear exists. So give up trying to live in truth on those issues because you won't be able to. It's just a fake existence doing that. The best thing you can do is feel the fear so that you're able to have that truth absorbed. That's the best thing you can do. So you can welcome truth about yourself. You, you can welcome the fact that, yeah, I'm frightened. That's a truth about yourself. I'm terrified. Of most things. <laughs> and there I am again. I'm afraid. Oh, that's a truth about me. Oh, I just avoided that and I was nasty to that person. There's a truth about me. That's a, that's a truthful way of living and it helps you expose your fear more and more. But I, a lot of us get to the point of going, yeah, I'm afraid. And then we kind of, because we're afraid, we, we step back from it and begin to rationalise the other reasons why we're doing mm. things. Oh, I just had to tell them a the truth when really it was about pushing away, you know, an interaction fear. that was it's making us afraid. Mm. Can I give you an illustration of my life uh, again? Uh, there's, before I um, allowed myself to go through the psychological experience of coming to terms with my own identity, I used to have many memories about my identity, of course, and I just put them in what, what I would classify now as the fear basket. <laughs> it's also called the too hard basket. You, you know that basket? Okay, so here's the basket, and it's called the Too Hard Basket, which, which, which really should be renamed to be the Fear Basket. You need another O on the two, babe. Uh, so Too too Hard Basket. So it's the Too Hard Basket, and it really should be named the Fear Basket. And what I used to do with all of my experiences, well, I would put them in this basket if, I, if they got too strong. But there was a lot of experiences I had that I thought I could handle the fear. And so one of them was that I used to speak in front of around 5,000 people at one point in my life, right? So for two days beforehand, I would be beside myself with terror, right? Speaking to large groups of people. And, uh, and eventually, I got so used to doing it that I was quite relaxed. And I actually believed that I had no fear at all about speaking in front of large groups of people. I had no fear. Uh, so eventually I spoke in front of these large groups. So in other words, my habit made me think and feel like I'd reduce my fear. 
Does that make sense? So, so come along all of the issues of having to work through my emotions. So I start working through my emotions. You know what, what happened? I couldn't speak to one person without getting afraid. All right? So that was in me already. And I had just used my will in such a strong negative manner, putting everything that I was afraid of in this two hard basket, anything that I felt like I cope with, I would actually habitually get to the point where I could do it and do it seemingly in a relaxed manner, but while I internally still felt terror, which I was denying. Right? And, and I got to this point where I couldn't even speak to one person without getting afraid. Now, at that time, I thought that I'd made a terrible mistake. Because I went from being able to speak to 5,000 people to, be able to only being able to speak to one person and being afraid. I used to go shopping in that place when I was afraid of one person. And, uh, and I would be too afraid to get out of the car to walk into the shopping centre to buy the things that I need. Right? Now that's a bit of a trouble when you're living by yourself. Right? Because there's no one else to do it for you. So eventually what I tried to do it was I'd go to the shopping centre and during this phase I would feel all of my feelings. I would go to the shopping centre and, and, and I think I've told you this before. I would sit there for four hours doing nothing having people look at me and going, what's going on with him? You know, why is he sitting there with tears rolling down his face, whatever? And I would do, deal with the fear that I felt in the shopping centre. Now, eventually, I dealt with a lot, most of this fear. And now, I can be myself completely, no matter who's around. So, the audience uh, a few weeks ago was about, I think it was about two point something million. And I was still able to be myself. Right? But I had to go through this place where it looked like everything was getting worse. Because that was the place where I started to feel what was in the too hard basket and therefore feel the fear that was present. I had to go through that place. And when you're going through that place, you believe things are worse. Right? But actually they're better. So some people have come up to us recently and said, oh, you know, I'm really worried. And you go, okay, what's you worried about? And they tell us this whole story. We say, why are you worried about that? that was, that's because you're in fear now. That's fantastic. Right? And they go, but, but all confused, you know, like, but, but uh, my, life's, my life feels worse. I say, yeah, yeah, it's going to feel like that. It's going to feel like that because you're now feeling your fear. You can have all sorts of law of attraction events triggering your fear now because you're willing to go through them. You're willing to go through them? <laughs> okay. Um, let's go to Rachel. Rachel. Kind of just answered my question, but I'll go for it anyway. Yep. I wanted to know how to stay open to that fear. And, yeah, I feel like you really did just answer it. No, me. but it's a good question. Very good question. How to stay open to the fear. The way you stay open to the fear is you focus on these qualities. So let's look... And, and that's what I wanted to ask, as well as loving myself, because I was hearing you say before with the examples of the orchard and yep. stuff, staying open, I mean, and I know that I'm really spirit-influenced as well, so how do I stay open? Well, let's look at each one of these and look at how it affects staying open to your fear. Remember, your fear is the main reason why... When we, when we place fear as our God, as I spoke of yesterday, that's the main reason why we don't do these things. So, so because what we do is we say, that fear belongs up here in a priority list. So fear comes before love, fear comes before truth, fear comes before humility and so forth. Once we're prepared to feel our own fear, we no longer honour fear in that regard. In other words, we no longer place it as the highest priority in our life. We no longer see it, even though we feel that it should be, we no longer will allow ourselves to continue placing it in this high priority in our life anymore. And what we do in that moment, when we love ourselves, we're actually f allowing ourselves to feel the fear. That is loving yourself more. See, before when you're denying your fear, that's not loving yourself as much. Because your fear is in you, wrecking your body, wrecking your life, having all of these attraction events occur, the cause of all these negative events. 
And that's not loving to you in that moment. When you start allowing yourself to feel this fear, now you're loving yourself more. This is wonderful. And like, like God's going, at last, my daughter is letting go of some things. Right? That's how God sees it. We're also in a more truthful place because most of the time, if you think before we feel fear, most of the time we believe we have none or very little. Right? We tell ourselves, oh, I haven't got much fear. You know, I might be afraid of, you know, and usually we come up with physical things. Like, I'm, I'm afraid of snakes, you know, but, but I don't really have much fear of emotion, you know. I don't have much fear of people, you know. But once we start getting more honest with ourselves, we start realising that our primary fears are actually our personal emotions. And our primary fears are not a snake or a spider or some other physical thing, but rather what's inside of us, shame and other emotions inside of us are our primary fears. So when we honour the truth of that and honour the fact that we start feeling the fear, we are now in far more harmony with God and therefore we will be able to feel God a lot more in that place. We're also far more humble if you think about it. Because now instead of reverting to anger and control and addiction all the time, which is what we use to, to stay away from our fear before, now we're saying, I'm refusing to go to my anger all the time. I'm refusing to go to my addictions all the time. I, instead, what I'm going to do is hum be humble to the experience of this fear, even if it feels terrible. Even if, it, if, if I feel terrible for six months or 12 months. That's how long it takes. For myself, my, my primary fears took me around nearly four years to, to release. Does that make sense? So it took me nearly four years to go through the process of releasing most of my fears. Of course, I was, I've been tortured and I've had all other sorts of things happen, things that you haven't had happen, so there's a chance that you will take less than that if you allow yourself to feel your fear. But if you really have faith in God, no matter how long that process takes, you will do it. And that's what I had to come to terms with. How much faith do I have with God that God is leading me through this process to get me beyond my fear? And I realized that a lot of it depended on my will. I had to be willing to stay in this place of feeling this rather than always trying to get myself out of it, always trying to take some kind of alternative action. You know, distract myself go and do something, get some exercise, you know, all the other things that I would try to do to, to reduce the feeling of this fear. In fact, I got to the point where I had so much fear in my body that I found that I had to lay up to four hours a day in my bed, just flat, feel the fear in my body and just feel in a panic for that four hours. Right? And after I did that, and I used to do that every single day, and remember I did that for nearly four years. So... By the time the four hours dissipated, the fear, I could feel the fear relieved myself and my body. And then I could get up and do some things without fear. I don't, but only then. Right? And that took, that took around four hours a day for me. Now, like I said, you know, if you've been tortured or other things have happened to you, then naturally that might be the case for you too. But it, it was wrecking my body so much. I was 33 years of age when I began processing fear. And everybody thought that I had Parkinson's disease. Everybody who met me. Because I would shake like this. And they would say, what's wrong with you? And I would say, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> and I would be sh like shaking so much that everyone could see me shaking so much. And they'd all be asking me what's going on. And, I'd, and, and I didn't know what was happening at the time until I started feeling that. And then I realised that's what it's all about. That's why I'm shaking like this. Now, it took, as I said, it took some period, like, and particularly after I went through a lot of my uh, memories about, um, about identity and all those kind of things, I went through another bout of it, which took four years. And then when I came out of that, now I feel much better, much better. I still have fears that I recognise, but now it doesn't govern my life anymore, right? Now, when you can see that if... If you really honour each of these qualities, right, then they will help you feel this fear. But all you have to do is compromise in one of these areas and all of a sudden you won't be feeling fear anymore. So if you compromise by saying, I don't want to use my will to feel my fear, bang, you, you, you will find that you won't be able to feel it anymore. Right? Or if you compromise by, by going, I don't have any faith 
that if I release my fear, that it, it can actually be released. I don't have any belief in that. I don't have any belief that I can be perfect without fear. And because you don't have any faith that it's even possible, you're not even going to try. You won't even try. You'll try everything else other than that. So many of you have spent five years with your fear going, what else can I do other than that? Right? Oh, I know what I'll do. I'll have a relationship. That'll help me get out of summer. Or I'll have a bit more sex. Or I'll drink a bit more. Or I'll, or I'll try and stay in my body. Or I'll do these practices. Or I'll, you know, whatever it is that you try to do to avoid fear. I'll be busy. I'll, I know what I'll do. I'll get rid of my uh, bed, you know, single house over on the sunny coast that's got a lovely garden already. And I'll, I'll buy 40 acres over here. And then I'll have so much work to do that I won't even know what I'm afraid of. Right? Many of you have chosen to make that decision for that one reason, actually. Right? To avoid a fear. Right? And when, when you go through this process, and that's really not having any faith in God that you, that you can address the fear. So when you actually allow yourself to hold on to these very positive qualities, you'll find eventually you'll get to the fear and you'll want to go through it. You want to. And, and every little bit you go through, there's another relief in my life. Another thing gone. That I don't have to worry about ever again. Ever. In all my future. Yep. And because you're willing to feel your fear, you won't be focused on feeding your addictions. So when you hit the spirit world, instead of, when you feel terrified, instead of trying to go and get an addiction met, you go, I'll feel my fear instead. You'll make that choice. Right? And you'll be in a far better condition when you do that. Far better condition. In fact, you'll probably be in the second sphere if you get to that point while you're on earth. Because the first sphere is all about fear. Right? It's all about fear. Now, I'm, I'm busting to go to the toilet. Yeah. And so is Mary, I can feel that. So we need to have a break. Do you mind if we just have a break for five or ten minutes? So, so we can go to the toilet and whatever. And I'm happy to answer your questions, but what time is it? Ten to one. Ten to one. So how long further do you want to go answering questions? How many have questions still? How many have questions still? So okay. I we're not going to get to the answer all the... Particularly at the speed I'm doing them at the moment. Um, so what we might do is just have a short break for, for toilet or whatever. And, um, and, and if everyone can formulate their question into a yes, no answer. <laughs> then I can almost guarantee that I can probably answer them all. <clears throat> Good luck with that, by the way. Um, yeah, and maybe if we just uh, go from uh, one till two and then we stop then and we'll have a bit of a break for dinner um, and then... Uh, the guy, there are some people that have pre prepared some songs and stuff for you to, if you want to stick around and have a listen to a little concert of some kind, um, then feel free to stick around after that. So we, we will answer questions for one more hour. Is that okay with you guys? <laughs>